Okay. <clears throat> I read a little article on the news site during the week, and it uh, brought a bit of fun and joy to me because it did mention that according to much research done over and over and again, it's been pretty much confirmed that the happiest years of your life are when you're young, around 23, or when you're old, around 68, 69. And of course, <laughs> that is my age, 68, 16, well 68, getting on to 69 soon. And for 23, that was the year when I uh, left the world and became a monk. And it was a very happy time for me when I became a monk. I know that sometimes people ask that question, why did you become a monk? And just to go off on a tangent, the reason why I wanted to become a monk was because, you know, meditation was very beautiful and very peaceful. And I thought I was in a good time of my life, only 23 years of age, had a good education, had my certificates, I was healthy, and of course I was handsome, <laughs> in my ideas. So anyway, I decided to go off and I decided to go to Thailand to become a monk for about two or three years. That was my goal, just for two or three years to become a monk, to become fully enlightened and go back and get married and have kids. <laughs> That's how little I knew about what enlightenment really was. But there was one thing which I always noticed, was that when I did shave my hair and put on these brown robes, there was a great sense of peace and belonging. And it was not just something which was superficial, because I do remember clearly those first days as being a novice monk, of waking up in the morning, actually in the middle of the night, having had a nightmare. I had nightmares, and I very rarely have nightmares as a lay person. But the nightmare that I experienced as a, a novice monk the nightmare I had was that I was a layman. And when I opened my eyes and saw my robes folded neatly next to my bed, which was on the floor, of course, when I saw them neatly folded, <sighs> I was a monastic. I was in brown. And that gave me so much joy and fulfillment. I closed my eyes and went almost immediately into a nice deep sleep and had a very good night's rest. But it taught me something. That nightmare repeated for about four or five nights in a row. And that told me just how happy I was as a 23-year-old in these brown robes. It's almost that this was my life and this is where I belonged. And I knew that in a level which was so deep it would come out in the middle of the night. So, later on, 45, 46 years later, now an old monk. This is supposed to be the next happiest time of my life. A 68, 69-year-old, yay! And I don't know why, but I don't think it's true. Because I think the happiness is going to get greater and greater and greater, even though you're old. Because as a monk, we go on a different path. A path of not acquiring safety or security, not acquiring just uh, renown, being well known. That's not the purpose of our life. We find our, what you might call superannuation, not really superannuation in money, but super happiness, super peace, in another way. Whereas the world tends to accumulate things, as a monk we try and give away things, to give up, to have less, not more. And it's not just physical things. As you all know, does the monk doesn't have money. As a monk, any um, certificates, we give them away a long time ago. Oh, I still recall 
that I don't need certificates, but other people do. I remember just after being a monk for seven years, I went home to visit my poor mother in her little council flat. And she said that she had my two university degrees from Cambridge, a, a BA and an MA. She said, what should I do with these? And I just, seven, seven year old monk, I was at 30 years of age, <coughs> of age at the time. And I took them, I said, we don't need these, I'm a monk now, I don't need certificates and degrees. And I tore them up and put them in the rubbish bin. And my mother never said anything. And I went off into my room to meditate for an hour. And when I came out again to see if I can get a cup of tea, I saw my mother had taken all the torn bits of those degrees, those pieces of paper, those certificates, taken them all out and was assembling them like a jigsaw puzzle and carefully taping them all back together again. I didn't need them. But I was my mother's son. My mother needed that. <laughs> and I felt so bad how selfish I was, giving up, only thinking of myself, not realizing that my life does intersect with others, especially people like your mother or father, brothers and sisters, people who care for you. And so because of that, I felt it was a very great lesson which I learned, never just to think how much I can give up, but also how that affects others as well. And so little by little, just, you know, as a monk, you learn just many of the secrets of happiness. And I haven't got much in my life, but I have lots and lots and lots of happiness and peace. And sometimes you wonder why people complain at this time. Time of lockdown, time of COVID, when people get unhappy just not being able to go outside into the world. To me, that when I'm not able to go outside into the world, when I'm on retreats, they're some of the happiest times of my life. That time, I think it was roughly about 2002, 2003, when I had the great opportunity to have a, a sabbatical, as they call it, that I was looking after Bodhinyana Monastery with Ajahn Yanadamo helping. And he decided to have a sabbatical first, so off he went. And when he came back, it was supposed to be my turn to have a year off to go anywhere in the world I wanted to, and with no responsibilities. And unfortunately, that I could only get six months because Ajahn Yana had volunteered to do a job over in Thailand. And so I only had six months. But they said, wherever you want to go in the world, you know, there's lots of friends, lots of places you can go. And you know what I did? I chose to do a six month silent retreat in Bodhinyana Monastery. To stay where I was. Why do I want to go places? Instead, I just had a nice, quiet time. Six months when I never saw anyone. I never saw a human being for six months let alone spoke to one. I just really got to know the, the animals in the locality. Every afternoon, every afternoon, a, a eagle, a pair of eagles, would actually take their young to train in flying. I knew the time and I would always wait and watch for them to train their young flying over the hills above uh, Keysborough, that's just south of Serpentine. It was a beautiful thing to watch. One thing I noticed there, that I didn't have physical company. I was by myself, but I had lots of peace, lots of freedom. There was no stress on my mind to have to go somewhere or do something or keep some appointment. I could sleep any time of the day or night when I was tired, I could rest. When I was energized, I could get up and meditate. There's so much meditation. It was a beautiful time of my life. And sometimes I just wonder, there was so much happiness and joy there. 
in solitude? Why is it that when people are locked down and are just in a house by themselves or in a room by themselves or in a house together, why can't they live at peace with one another? After a while it's easy to learn how to be at peace with yourself. You know how to be at peace with yourself. It's easy how to be at peace with others. How do we actually do that? It's by not asking so much of each other. When you see somebody else, if you see any faults in the other person you're locked up with for the COVID time, if you see any faults in them, they're only your own faults. People aren't perfect. And so many times I've given those similes of looking at faults as not faults at all, but the beautiful parts of a human being. The old two bad bricks in the wall story. I was one who could only see perfection, and if it was imperfect, I felt that I was a personal failure. So laying a wall and laying two crooked bricks, I felt terrible about that. Our Buddhist Society of West Australia's donors, it was their money, and I wasted it by making a terrible wall, so I thought. Until someone taught me how beautiful that wall was. It had two bad bricks in it, but 998 beautiful bricks. I know that many of you have heard that story before, but if you complain about this time of COVID, of lockdown, you complain about we can't do this, we can't do that. There's so many things you can do. Yeah, you can complain about two crooked bricks or ten crooked, crooked bricks. But there's so much stuff which is beautiful in this world. You may complain about you know, your partner snoring in bed at night and you can't get to sleep or you listen. It's so easy to find fault. But a wise person, what we learn is to learn to see the beautiful part of things. When you see the beautiful part of the war, then the faults are not something which disturbs you anymore. They give it character. Oh, it was a wonderful addition to that story when I was a teaching at the Cancer Wellness Association. It's now called a Solaris Cancer Wellness. When I was teaching over there, and, uh, oh, so many years ago, and a builder came up and told me, he said, don't worry about your two bad bricks, Ajahn Brahm. He said, I'm a professional builder and all builders make those mistakes. But in the building profession, he said, when one of our, one of our workers, when they actually make a mistake like that, we tell our clients, it's a feature. No other house in the whole of Perth has a crooked wall like that. It's a feature. It's unique. And we charge him a few thousand dollars extra for the special feature. And that's what he actually said to me. And I thought, what a wonderful way of looking at mistakes. The things which sometimes you feel you don't like. Looking at them another way, looking at them as a, as a feature. And if I can do things like that, looking at them as a feature, rather than it's a mistake. They just add to the happiness and the beauty of the world. And that's how I see things. There are some people who get sick and some people who die in the present time. And the question which has often come up to me, and it came up even during the week, is you know, what do we do? You know, when somebody, a loved one of ours, is very sick and is dying, and we can't be with them at the last time of their life. You cannot be with them at that last few moments of their life. But that's looking at a very negative two bad brick in the wall. You've been with them for so many other periods of your life. So many other times you shared your joy and happiness. And anyway, something I've noticed in my life as a Buddhist monk, looking after people, at those last moments of this particular life. One of the things I've noticed is that death is a very private moment anyway. Are you really with them at the last moments of their life? Because most people, especially if they do have uh, coronavirus and it's very severe, they usually put in a coma. 
you can see them, you can hold their hand, but are you really with them anyway? And even if they're not so um, unconscious of those last moments of their life, I have seen this and heard the stories so many times as well, that sometimes the, the family are there in the hospital room and the person is getting so close to dying and you're waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing seems to be happening and then you decide, the close family decide just to go out for a snack or get something to eat so you all leave and a few seconds after you leave or minutes the person dies dying is private so to feel that you need to be with someone when they die sometimes is disturbing the person and sometimes you know the best thing to do is to say goodbye and then let them go let them travel to their next life but you cannot go with them you say goodbye and walk out of the room so sometimes that when people say oh but they're dying I need to be with them is it for them or is it some sort of craving, some sort of attachment which just causes problems for you? You don't need to be there. And of course, uh, sometimes again, like usual, I tell so many stories. But I remember telling this story to someone recently that just around the corner from here, I hope it wasn't last week by the way, there was a person who used to come here and a very good uh, friend and a sort of very good Buddhist as well but very, very Western and so he lived around the corner alone he was a ranger in uh, one of the shires close by one of the council areas close by and he said that he was at home alone in his bed one evening and then in the middle of the night, he just felt that something strange was happening in his room. It wasn't fear, like as if he thought there was a, a burglar coming into the house, but he knew that something wasn't quite right. So he turned on the bedside light and he looked and he told me directly that at the end of his bed, he saw his mother standing very clear, as clear as if you'd see a person on the street not shadowy or wispy but a real clear image and the person was his mother and his mother lived in Essex just outside of London and he knew immediately that his mother must have died and that never made him afraid, it says it's the only time he'd ever seen a ghost because his mother was in England and now she was seen in Perth because his mother was smiling at him with so much joy and happiness and love and he realized his mother had come for one last time to say goodbye to her son and it lasted about five or six minutes so he said clear image he was not afraid silently leaning up in bed looking at his mum and his mother smiling so much love for the last time to her son he wasn't there when she died but he was there afterwards and she came to say goodbye and those are sort of little ways of looking at life and death which take away a lot of the, the pain a lot of the fear a lot of the, the untruth where people think I have to be there when somebody dies I even have to be there at the funeral service sometimes a funeral service happens and you're not allowed to be there who is a funeral service really for? is it for the one who's dead? or is it for the people who are left behind? it's not really for the person who's died if they really need to, they can come and see you another time. 
another place. They can make that choice. But, oh, while I'm on this, there's another story which comes to my mind about a, a friend who used to come to this temple and go to Bodhinyana Monastery and also to Dhammasara in those early days. And he was a, a builder. He had a friend over in Kalgoorlie who was also a builder. And they would you know, do jobs together, but they were just really good friends. But unfortunately, his friend in Kalgoorlie developed cancer. And he paid for the ticket from fly from Kalgoorlie to Perth to come and see me for get some counselling towards the end of his journey with cancer. And he's a very nice gentleman, very Australian, this Kalgoorlie builder. You know, he, he came in what we always call Australian national dress. Even though it was a Buddhist monastery, that's all he had was the thongs, the, the shorts and the t-shirt. But he's a very wonderful, very respectful fellow. You don't show respect by what you wear as much as by how you behave. And anyway, that I gave him some advice and then he died a few days later in Kalgoorlie. But the interesting part was my friend who introduced him I went over to <coughs> Kalgoorlie for the funeral and came back again a few day, a day or two later. And a day or two later, he said he was woken up in the middle of the night. He thought it was his wife elbowing him, so he said to me. And he turned around to his wife and told her off for waking him up and saw that his wife was fast asleep and realized something else had woken him up. And he turned around and it was a dead man. It was his Kalgoorlie friend who was standing by the bedside. But the weird part was his friend was not, used, not wearing his usual attire. He was wearing a shirt, a jacket, with a polka dot bow tie, which was weird. He'd never seen him dressed like that at all before. So he woke his wife, and when he turned to wake his wife, the image of his friend vanished too. They got up and searched around the house, and they couldn't find any trace of him. And then he came and told me that. He said, it was really weird, because I've never seen him dressed like that before, ever. I said, what about when he died? He said, oh, it was a closed coffin, so he couldn't see inside. So I said, ask his wife. <laughs> and of course, I wouldn't be telling this story if the fact was that his wife had put him in a jacket, a shirt, and a bow tie inside the coffin. Why, said his friend from Perth, well, I brought this suit for him, a nice shirt and a bow tie, years ago, and he would never wear it. And I thought, well, at least when he dies, I can dress him up properly, and he can't complain. <laughs> and that's how we saw him. So anyway, that sometimes people will visit you afterwards. So you don't need to worry. And anyway, just... We don't worry about or be concerned about the ending of a life as much as what happened before. We measure our time together, not by its endings, but by the time and the joy and the experiences we had together while everyone was alive. So if a person you know is really sick and dying, you can't be with them at the very end. Even what you can do you don't need to be a great meditator to do this. You just to sit down, close your eyes and think of them. And give them your very, very best. And if you can't do more than that, that's a wonderful thing you can do. And maybe later on you can do something. You know, over here in Perth, I've been here over 36, 37 years now. And one of the the first year I was here was during the time of the, uh, after the Vietnam War. And there were many, many Cambodian refugees were settled here in Perth. And I still recall going to the hostel in Shenton Park with a uh, former abbot of this place, Ajahn Chakaro, going over there to 
welcome the the new arrivals from Cambodia, the refugees who had been resettled in this land. And when we went there, they could see that we looked like monks, but we knew nothing of the Khmer language. And even though Ajahn Jakro tried to talk to them, they didn't understand anything. Until I suggested that we do some Buddhist chanting. And that Buddhist chanting, which is done in Pali language, is something which we all share, whether it's in Burma, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Buddhists, in Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and even in Malaysia and Singapore. It's a common language. And so when we started chanting, I still remember just looking at a first of all a few of the old ladies who put up their hands and started crying. The tears started coming out of their eyes as they could recognize something from their homeland which they could now enjoy here in Australia. And of course they became very close to our Bodhinyana monastery and they still are and they're very valued community. But the point was that we found something which we shared and gave joy to them, which is a wonderful thing to do. And that was sometimes, that chanting can sometimes touch people. Which is one of the reasons why that one of those gentlemen, I never knew this until much later, one of those gentlemen, one of those Khmer leaders, he's very, very old now, but he's still alive, good on him. One of those uh, Cambodian leaders, he wanted to invite the monks for a, a blessing ceremony in his apartment over in uh, just outside Manning Road. And as we started the chanting, he, he, he was married, he uh, met a nice lady in the, the camp in Aranya Patet and they got married. To, and he actually moved just a, a few foot in front of her. And as we were chanting, out of the shirt pocket, he pulled out this old black and white photograph. And it was creased all over. And I was looking at that while doing the chanting and wondering why? And what was the meaning of him moving forward away from his current wife and getting the picture of this young, beautiful Khmer girl? And then as he looked at it during the chanting, crying his eyes out, weeping, crying. And as the chanting finished, he stopped his crying and he put the photograph back in his pocket and then rejoined his wife. Found out afterwards, the story was that that was his first wife who he met in the villages and during the time of the Khmer Rouge, that they were treated badly. And he escaped with his wife. He was one of the few people who managed to find his way over the border into what you th thought would be safety in Thailand. But on that journey, you know, which people see in those movies, Killing Fields, he said, after they, they got to so-called safety, he found that on that journey his wife had contracted malaria fever and it was so severe that they couldn't keep her alive. He comes so close to success on his escape. He made it over the border and his wife made it over the border but a few days later she died. And of course being a refugee with absolutely nothing and being unable to mourn the death of his wife, even though his wife was there, he could not do anything at the time. He could not perform any ceremonies. He didn't have the means to do that. He waited for about, I don't know how many years, five, six, seven years. And he got married in the meantime. He obviously asked permission from his wife. He still had unfinished business with his first wife. And the whole ceremony to which I attended, was just for that first wife. It was her funeral. It was a time he could say thank you. 
and time he could let her go and then go back and join his new wife, his second wife and put away all that past. It was an occasion when if you cannot perform those funeral services when somebody passes away, especially in some countries now because of COVID, if you can't actually do them now, you can always do them later. You can say, sorry for all the things you'd have loved to do but which you couldn't do. You can remember all the mistakes, but don't just remember the faults and mistakes. Always put them in a context. Two bad bricks in a wall amongst 998 beautiful bricks. You've had a beautiful life. Enjoy it. Don't measure a life by how it ended. Measure it by what went beforehand and the happiness which you have. Don't me keep worrying about when these COVID crisis will end. All I know is it won't end today, probably not tomorrow. So I'm not going to wait to enjoy the peace and happiness and tranquility which I can experience even just being in my room which is a cave over in Serpentine or just being in a little hall here over in Nolamara giving a talk. I never try and wait till things are over to find happiness. Otherwise I will never find it. I've learned how to look for the happiness and peace now where I am and it's more than enough. It's more than enough to find a lot of joy and peace and fulfillment. During a six month personal silent retreat not seeing anybody, I saw so much of myself so much of how I worked and so much of the animals in the forest. I had a wonderful, peaceful time. Every day enjoyable. Never worrying or looking at how many days are left on the retreat. Those people who look for the future and think, oh, once COVID is over, then I'll be happy. No, it'll just be more of the same. Maybe not this crisis, another crisis. The world has always has crises, so that's its nature. Many, many people are always trying to attain something or get something and never really actually being here. I always say these times of difficulties are opportunities. Opportunities to stop. To stop and to learn. To learn and to grow. Just to realize just how little we are in control of our destiny and how little we need to be in control. When we're in control, what does that mean anyway? It means you're looking at the direction you're trying to move your life towards. For me, I'm not trying to move towards anything. I'm just happy being here. I don't move, but the world moves. And this is one of the ways where I can learn to be present. Even that old story of when I go traveling, I'm sitting in an aircraft. Of course, I can't do that, that doesn't matter. I'm sitting in an aircraft, I don't move at all. The aircraft does the moving. Coming here, sit in the car, I don't move, the car moves. The scenery around me changes, but I'm always here. And when you, you uh, think of all the different things which we do in this world, or there's, there's wars, or there's pandemics, or there's wonderful times of prosperity and peace. Is it really peace, prosperity? I don't know when there is prosperity, people don't spend the money anyway, they put it in the bank and save it up. Save it up for what? You know, sometimes maybe I think in different ways. But sometimes that if there's something you can do and enjoy this moment, please take the opportunity and do it. The time of COVID is always teaching us of the, number one, the fragility of this world. We don't know how long it's going to last. The fragility of you, of how strong you are, and when you can do this, when you can do that. And the, the reason you don't need to do all these things to find peace and happiness. It's a great time if you are a Buddhist to make sure you practice those Buddhist teachings. You can see just how the monks enjoy themselves and the nuns at Dhammasara just with this beautiful contentment and peace and happiness. 
this is what we have, this is good enough. It comes to my mind over, must be over 40 years ago, 42 years ago or something, I was going to a, a ceremony in the northeast of Thailand in a, a place which was not really developed yet. There was a lot of forest, a lot of jungle still around. I remember that we were supposed to be there for a ceremony at 7 p.m. when it got dark. It was only about 2 p.m. So I went for a walk in the forest and I came to a clearing. In the middle of the clearing was a bamboo and thatch hut. It was no, not a monk's hut, it was a small house. And you can see the the owner of that house, the man and his wife. I don't know how many kids. And they were just running around with so much joy and laughter. I never, I couldn't remember seeing such joy and laughter in the children in UK. I couldn't imagine seeing such happiness of that man and his wife, of all the people I knew say in Cambridge or in London. And it really shook me just how this little family had hardly anything except each other and how much joy they were showing. I was actually crouching in the bu bushes just watching, just watching, making sure I wasn't seen because I would disturb what I was observing. And just, it really taught me how little you need to have happiness. And sometimes if we aren't happy, if we, the 23 year old or the 69 year old are probably happy because they haven't got very much. 23, you're still learning. 69, you're probably giving it away to all your kids. At least a lot of it. But anyway, in those times when you have little, sometimes we may not have much in the bank. We have the great opportunities to have much in our hearts. A lot of beauty, a lot of non-judgment, a lot of wisdom to be able to let go and enjoy these moments. And for all of us now, in those parts of the world where you, you can't go to the temple, you can't go to the pub, you can't go out to watch a movie, you can't go out to get a beautiful dinner, you can't even sometimes go out to see your grandma in the old people's home, and you can't go to a funeral service, and you can't go to a marriage, and, there's so much which you can't do, you can't go traveling. Does it really matter? What you are doing is you're learning, just right there in your home, as I said last week, with the family you already have. You can find so much peace and happiness. Don't ask what's missing. Just remember what you have. Don't ask about what's going to happen next week. Be concerned with what's happening today. It's been a beautiful day here in Western Australia. Peaceful, not too hot, not too cold. Beautiful day just to sit and watch the sun go down. Beautiful day just to watch the little animals play in the forest. Wonderful day just to watch a little parrot just sitting next to somebody not knowing whether they should eat something or whether it's too scary. So much of life, you can appreciate its beauty. So much of yourself, you can appreciate your beauty. You're not the best in the world, but you're far from the worst. This human being, and you look at yourself, and just all the wonderful things that you have done. You may not be so young as you used to be, but you're certainly not as old as you're going to be. So you can enjoy these moments and have some peace and happiness in this present moment. Which means at 23 or 69, and anything in between if you understand the secrets of life. When you're really sick in hospital, or you know, you watch somebody else is sick in hospital. Remember sickness is only part of your body. Your mind is far greater than that. You can always find some peace and happiness no matter what's happening to you in life, no matter where you are. And this particular time of this planet 
is this great opportunity to learn those teachings. To learn just how to be happy when you're stuck at home 24 hours. Even just one of our monks, he just came in from, from Melbourne just uh, about 12 days ago. So he's in quarantine. And he's having a wonderful time, for what he sort of sent an email to me. A wonderful time just being in the room, not being able to go out. We send food to him. He's got a shower and toilet there. One time of the day he stands in one window when the sun comes up to warm himself. He knows another time of the day the sun is shining through another window, <laughs> so he moves over there. And this is how he adapts, to find where the sun shines in the quarantine of just two weeks where he can't go out. In the same way, if you're in that quarantine somewhere in this world, in your home, in a house, there's always places in your house where the sun shines in, if that's what you want. There's places where you can enjoy. And it can be, keep it very simple. And that means you find that this time is a beautiful time for us to learn so much more about ourselves, so much more about how to live with other people, so much more how to live with life simply, where we don't need very much, which means that we have a much more peaceful, happy life. So that's a little talk for this evening about finding happiness anywhere. Finding happiness in an old body by just meditating, relaxing it. Finding happiness just in solitude. Finding happiness any place in this world. Thank you all for listening. Now we're going to have some questions, I hope. I'm very happy to answer que any questions on any subject within, <laughs> within reason. <laughs> Let's see how many we've got today. Lots of great okay, excellent. So the audience are overseas because we're not supposed to have any people in this room except the people doing the audiovisual. Okay. Question one from the USA. Dear Ajahn Brahm, you have mentioned how we can feel positive or negative energy coming from another person. In that case, how important it is to protect self-image for survival in society? Well, it's not really self-image. You, you can feel positive energy coming from another person, and you can feel negative energy coming from another person, but now how much energy are you giving out to other people? And what's your positive energy level? And how can you create more positive energy in yourself? And it's not that hard to do, especially doing things like loving-kindness, compassion to other beings and just to all beings. And you start off, you know, it's, sometimes people say it's so hard because some of these people are just really terrible people or terrible animals. How can you just be so kind to them? They're the people who need it the most. But in order to achieve that, you start off with people it's very easy to be kind to. So you know, I live with monks. So they're, they're really good monks. Yeah, sometimes they can drive you crazy and nuts sometimes. So can anybody. And sometimes I drive people nuts sometimes, I'm sure, with some of my stupid jokes and crazy stuff. But nevertheless, just you get to love one another and care for one another. You respect the good qualities and the people you live with. To the point that, you know, you spend so much kindness and joy towards all beings in the place where you live. And if you can't get, please excuse me, but you can't get better than you know, monks, harmless beings who are just living a life of, of uh, renunciation, giving up things, and not really wanting too much from others. So it's a beautiful community to live with. And because we're giving up so much, it's much easier to be kind to them. So you think of them, be kind to them. And from the easy stuff, you get this wonderful feeling of kindness coming up. Use the simple stuff, first of all. So I often say, if you're going to light a, like a fire to cook your dinner, you've got to start with the easy stuff, first of all, like with paper or with gas or kerosene or something. Some with something which easily takes the flame. And then you build up afterwards to some, some harder stuff, like wood or sappy logs. But start with the easy stuff, first of all. So you deliberately cultivate 
feelings of happiness and joy and service towards other beings. It starts with easy stuff, and then it builds and builds and builds, and so you can be happy towards anybody. And positive, so much positive energy. Oh, I can't sort of resist this, what I call Julie's story. There's one of the fantastic stories. Julie was this young woman from Sydney, and just in the starting off her life, she had a beautiful husband and this beautiful kid called Holly. And that was the story when she was starting a business, fashion business or something, and she got this, uh, uh, this contract being um, negotiated with a big um, distributing house in, in London. And she got the call, come now because, you know, we were ready to sign the contract and this would be putting her business to another level. But the trouble was her daughter, Holly, was only about three or four years of age. And so, fortunately, her husband was a really good man. And they're you know, very kind, very soft. And so he said, I'll look after her. So he looked after the daughter and she got on the first flight available. This was a few years ago now, to Heathrow. And she told me all about what happened afterwards, which is a wonderful little anecdote. That she managed to, to book into her hotel, to check in, sorry, to her hotel, have a shower, get changed, no rest, and go to the boardroom of this big company to negotiate the deal. And that was where the directors were there in the boardroom, but the CEO hadn't arrived yet. The directors, you know, who are you? And when they, she said who she was, they said, well, you just wasted your time. You might as well go back to the hotel and get on the next plane back to Sydney. No way is the CEO going to sign anything. He's in a very bad mood. And you know, we know him. When he's in such a bad mood, he's not going to do anything, especially for you. But good old Julie, she decided, I'm going to see him anyway. Okay, suit yourself, you've been warned. So what she did, is she sat down in a corner and meditated. A good disciple. She sat down in a corner, meditated, and her great meditation was loving kindness. It's only for about five or ten minutes. And then the CEO burst in. Who's that? What's she doing in my boardroom? What does she think she's doing? He was really angry. Now, I can't really do anger that well. But you, know, you get some idea, I hope, about you know, what this, this boss from hell was like. And so you know, she was disturbed, came out of her meditation. But she was so peaceful, because that's what meditation does to you. It just really calms you down. And all the shouting and the red eyes and the steam coming out of his nose and whatever, that she just stood up and walked straight towards him. And he was glaring at her. And she just said to him, you have such beautiful blue eyes, just like my daughter Holly back in Sydney. <laughs> and she told me those words just came out of her mouth. She didn't premeditate them at all. He just had beautiful blue eyes. The rest of him was just on fire. But his eyes were blue and reminded her of her daughter back in Sydney, who she missed terribly. And this boss, apparently, he's just, his brain was fusing all over the place. He didn't know what to make of this. And one minute of silence, and then he smiled and said, Really? I've got beautiful blue eyes. <laughs> what do you want? I might need my contract. Oh, yeah, we'll sign it. And he signed the contract within five minutes. <laughs> and then she was just they were very peaceful, very happy. That boss walked out of the room, and she wanted to go back to her her um, hotel to get a rest. But they wouldn't let her. The other directors just formed a ring around her, so she told me. And they said, we're not letting you go until you teach us how the heck you did that and how it worked. A little bit of kindness. She used so much positive energy, she melted the fierce boss. So that's what you can do. <laughs> So you have positive and negative energy come from another person. In that case, how important is it to protect self-image? Not protect self-image. I don't like that word protecting. I like just bring up the positive energy in you. 
go and sit in meditation, be with some good people, be kind, be powerful, think positively, and then you go out there and share it for the world. And when you run out, don't protect it and keep it, share it, give it out. When you run out, you go and find a nice quiet place and do some more meditation, more loving kindness, more sort of being by yourself, walking in the forest is great. All those nice little things, especially with solitude, brings up good energy in you. And then you not, don't survive in society, you just do much better than survival. You actually help to heal society. Anyway, next question, how can we really let go while it's so hard to accept so many deaths all around us? To accept the deaths or refuse the deaths, you've got no choice. Those deaths happen, so what can you do? You try and help as much as you can, but there's so much you can't do. What it does, it reminds you just of you know, the fact that we can't always live just for 70 years, 80 years or whatever. So what we can do is we can value every day. Sometimes, so many deaths around us, it's a teaching for us. It teaches us to value life more. To value life more and not value sort of possessions so much. Not, pos not value our ego and admit we're wrong sometimes. It teaches us just to live more in the present rather than in the future. And to accept that this, the capricious nature of life, capricious means that life is totally uncontrollable. And that sometimes it does some weird, strange things like tsunamis, like wars, like disasters, like you know, tornadoes and stuff, bushfires here in Australia. Sometimes these things happen. And because of that, it means that uh, we learn how to accept not just life, but death as well. We get at peace, at peace with everything. You know, sometimes that there's a lot of death around us, but in wars, especially those big wars, the First World War, the Second World War, those wars, my, I was born after the Second World War, but my family were in that Second World War. And my mother was in the Blitz in London and with my grandma and bombed out, by which I mean terrorist houses so close together the, the bomb hit the people next door. Bang! And they were died immediately. The mother's house was blown apart. But you know, she survived with my grandma. How can they really let go? because they had no choice. They had to. And my mother, so the, her arm healed, my grandmother carried on, really nice people. Maybe I'm biased to say that, but very wonderful people. They accepted the deaths as being part of life. So we don't just look at the death. We also remember what went before then and before that. So we don't measure just how things end. But what we did and how we enjoyed and how we behaved when those people were alive with us. It teaches us not to be so negative, not to think of ourselves too much. We don't know when those people will not be here anymore. Okay, this is Ajahn Chah's simile. See this cup. Ajahn Chah would often use whatever he had. He said, can you see the crack in this cup? He asked me. And I'd look around, and I couldn't see any c crack in this cup. I think Ajahn Chah was cracked, not me, or not the cup. So there's no crack in it. He said, that's because it's microscopic, it's really small. But this cup has got a crack in it, it's glass. He said, one day someone will drop this, or they'll kick it and that crack will open up and this will break and be no more. He said, that's like human beings. We all got the crack in us. The crack which means we're fragile, that one day we'll get sick and one day we will die. It could be from COVID or from malaria or from just a car accident. There's so many ways to die. We know that we all got the crack. We will one day die. Is that depressing? 
He said, no. He said, if this was plastic and unbreakable, that would be depressing. It would be depressing because if it was plastic and unbreakable, I wouldn't need to care for it. I could do whatever I like with it, but because this is fragile, especially if this was, and this is not like high quality glass, it's not like a Waterford crystal or anything, but if this was, say, a crystal, a very valuable thing, and I'd really look after it, I'd care for it to the max. So because it's breakable, it's got a crack in it, because it's really valuable, that gives me more reason to care. Because this time is teaching us how fragile our loved ones are, how easy it is for them to die, or for us to die, is teaching us how fragile life is. And that results in us caring so much more. It's not just about letting go, it's about caring, caring for one another. Even if you don't even know one another, we care so much because we've got a crack in us. Okay, <laughs> okay. Dear Ajahn Pam, how do I let go of the attachment of wanting to let go of attachments? Because you try to let go of attachments, you want to let go of attachments, and you find it doesn't work. Just like, oh, for so many years when I was a young meditator, I wanted to be peaceful. And I, I wanted to be peaceful, I could never do it. And sometimes you stand back and you consider, what's going on there? That wanting to let go was too much busyness. So instead of wanting to be peaceful, I just let go of wanting and relaxed to the max. I didn't want anything in the whole world. If my mind was peaceful or not peaceful, that was its job. And I didn't force anything. When I didn't force anything, then I was peaceful. I relaxed, was patient. I made peace, be kind, be gentle, that's all. And then the attachments just unwind, unravel, they untie themselves. So you cannot let go of the attachment of wanting to let go of attachment, that just gets too complicated. You just relax, you sit there and stop thinking, be in this moment, stop wanting, don't want anything in the whole world, this is good enough for me. I'm happy to be here, even though I'm old, I'm tired, even though that, oh, my mind may not be as clear as it was yesterday, but this is good enough to me. I'm happy to be where I am. Then you find, because you've got nothing to do, nowhere to go, nothing to achieve, you get very peaceful. You're not doing anything. And this ego, which is made up of all you've done in your life, and which makes you do more things, that sense of self, that sense of ego, starts to vanish. It disappears slowly, till it goes completely. When there's no one in here, there's no one to do the attaching anymore. That is how attachments vanish. By your sense of an agency, a doer, being seen for what it is, just an illusion, a mirage. When that is gone, attachments are gone. You don't need anything. Lastly, do you have advice for how to keep inner peace while doing emotionally tough work such as investigative journalism to expose negative regimes? Oh, that's a good one, good question. How do you keep inner peace? But sometimes, if you do investigative journalism to expose negative regimes or negative people in those regimes, that sometimes you can get, your mind can get sort of um, obsessed and also see things in one way and not see another side of people. I know that sometimes I've, uh, it's part of my life now because I'm a senior monk. And I get sometimes to meet some very, very interesting people, like prime ministers and presidents and major generals and people with a lot of power. 
And when you go and visit these people, sometimes you know, people are just, whoa, at least when I see them, very, very negative. You know, oh, they're all very polite, seeing you in ceremonies and stuff, but really negative people. People you wouldn't like to be alone with. But anyway, there are sometimes some people, you, you see the positive side of them, because I'm a monk and they actually show you that positive side, and it's a beautiful side. And sometimes you've been with people in prisons, have been some very, very crazy bad people. According to what they've done, but they can be so kind and so wonderful. So sometimes, that if as a journalist, you have to, you know, to judge and put down some of the negative things which they are doing because it's harming other people. But sometimes, that what is it? Somebody said they're sort of good people in a bad situation, almost being forced to do bad things. And the choice of being a good person, standing up for something, takes a lot of courage. And some people just haven't got that in them. Sometimes to judge them, it's just a bad situation, a bad, uh, a bad set of uh, rules which make people do the bad things. But anyway, to keep your inner peace, you do your job as an investigative journalist. It's emotionally tough. But when you find your energy levels, your emotional goodness is starting to disappear, that's when you do need to time, take time out. Either to go to a monastery, a temple, a retreat center, or just go to a place by the beach or in the forest, and just recharge yourselves with good energy. Because especially if you're investigating bad people, that sometimes you investigate bad people and you become a, please excuse me, a bad person yourself. Sometimes, what was it Nietzsche said, the German philosopher, uh, Nietzsche, must be getting tired. You know, what was his first name? Frank, well, you know Nietzsche, the, the famous German philosopher. He said, don't look too long into the abyss, or the abyss will start looking into you. In other words, that what you look into, what you focus on, it's very easy to become that. So one does need to sort of segregate one's time. Time when you're working and investigating and time when you're with your family and friends, with your, the good people. Otherwise you lose perspective on life. And also try to understand that why good people do bad things. In all my life I've never met a bad person. I've met people who've done very, very bad things but not a bad person. You always see some beautiful goodness in them. And if you can see that, see the goodness, don't just see their bad acts, they're much more than that. Then it gives you a balance, a perspective. And especially with yourself, make sure you have some positive influences in your life. So when you go home from work, investigating very difficult regimes or people, you come home and see the goodness in life as well. Get balance. Anyway, I'm not quite sure if that worked for you, but anyway, that's a little answer for this evening. So, do you start? Excellent. So, as somebody again, I did last week, and somebody asked me at the end to give a nice little blessing for everybody, for their health and happiness and their freedom from so many difficulties in today's world. Oops. So it's not just listening to teachings, it's also a little bit of good energy for me going out to each one of you. Saba Roga Winimuto Saba Santa Pawajito Saba Vera Mati Gandoni Buto Chato Wang Bawa Sabiti o viva chantu sabaro go vina satu mate bo wan wan terayo suki diga yu go pawa api wa dan ha ni chang wu ta pa cha yeno cha Ayuano Sukang Balang. 
as a natural uh, blessing.